Why don't we get started? I'm just going to make sure. There we go. Uh, good evening, everybody. We have some more people. Come on in. Um, my name is Mara, like two Mara without the two at the beginning of it. I'm from the Yale Center on Climate Change and Health, and this summer I'm interning with the East Shore District Health Department. And today I'm going to be talking about climate change specific to the greater Brantford and sort of generalizable to the Connecticut region. Um, with me, I have my colleagues. I'll let them say hello. I'm Barbara DeFlerio. I'm a health educator at the East Shore District Health Department. And I'm Amy Marzik. I'm interning at the East Shore Health Department. So they're the other people that you see with their names here on the presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and just dive right out on into this. Um, but as I say that, I realize that you know sometimes you go to a, a presentation and somebody's like, all right, I'm just going to start talking about this subject. I don't personally like that. <laughs> um, I like people to get to know who I am, and then we'll, since we're a small group, maybe we'll do just a quick around the room just to see, you know, what's uh, what are your interests? Why are you here? But a little bit about me. I think I mentioned I, I'm a master's student at the University of Connecticut where after six long years, I will finally be getting my master's degree. I've been doing it part-time, like one or two classes at a time. Um, I'm originally from Texas. I didn't wear my cowboy boots today. They're a little uncomfy. Um, but I've kind of moved around a lot and my family was based in Mexico and Louisiana. So I spent a lot of time by the coast uh, uh, or coastlines of the United States, which is where I really started to see uh, sea level rise, climate change effects on communities that are there. So that's how I kind of got involved in the work. Um, I'm located near the Mystic Seaport. If anybody has visited, you know, the big giant tugboat at the main entrance, I'm about a block away from that. So, <laughs> so glad that I could join you all today. Now, um, your turn. So just very quickly, because I want to know the audience. Uh, who are you? What brings you here? What concerns do you have about climate change and maybe what brings you joy? I think that's the other part that's often left out of our conversation is, you know, what worries you, but also what makes you happy? Like, why are you fighting for or advocating for climate change? So I'm not going to pressure anybody to go first. I usually go from the first row back, hint, hint, <laughs> but I can pick somebody else. Anybody want to go? Yeah, I'll go. All right. Thank you. Um, my name is Christy, and I am very interested in climate change. I want to do whatever I want to do my part in terms of um, what I what I'm able to do from my home. Mm -hmm. um, and I am concerned about climate change. Um, I see, you know, we're so blessed in Connecticut um, that we're not having the floods and the fires and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and what the rest of the country is dealing with. They're very blessed in Connecticut, but I'm still concerned about it. And um, what brings me joy is my spirituality. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. Anybody else? I'm gonna call on Madison if she doesn't. Hi, <laughs> hello. Um, I'm Madison, I am at the Yonis at the East Shore District Health Department, so I'm here to support everyone. Um, I'm definitely concerned, I think, a lot of, about the kind of the corporate angle of my You know, vision every day. We think about you know larger systems. So if you work in a large office building, you know, um, in a cafeteria, all of, like if they have plastic, you know, serving trays or school lunches, you know, those are all institutions that buy you know huge quantities of you know things that are you know, contribute to the waste and things like that. Um, I would say it's hard for me for things like this. I tend to be motivated a little bit more by spite, which might sound not so great, but um, to be honest, um, I, I think I'm, I'm the joy for me comes from having that. Yeah, thank you. Ma'am, over. I saw your hand yeah, go. Yeah, like, Lisa. Hi. Lisa, hi. Uh, I'd like to learn more about the impact of climate change on our water supply. You know, obviously, we're in a drought as well as other parts of the country. But I'd like to learn more about what specifically will happen, you know, like in 10 to 15 years on our water supply in the Northeast. Great, thank you. Maybe I'll hop over there if you don't mind. Sure, um, I might not answer all the follow up points, but I'm Kayla, and I think what, what I'm interested in, I'm going to create my own. 
Absolutely. What I'm interested in is, um, you know, learning about small steps that people can do um, that they might not realize can help our planet, you know, in terms of uh, trying to delay or whatever you want to call it, uh, climate change, you know, learning about the sort of behaviors that um, if, you did, if you knew and if you just took an extra second, you might, you might make a different choice. Absolutely. Thank you. And their final. Um, hi, my name is Amelia. Um, I'm actually recording, so I'm a journalist right now. But I, I also came here because I'm also interested in climate change, but I'm also interested in how we can use different these different things and we can turn them into energy. So I'm very interested in the harnessing to reverse climate change to make it into an energy rather than just bringing it down. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you all for <laughs> introducing yourselves. Um, I, I always like doing that because oftentimes, you know, we, we give presentations and sometimes might say it's like, well, what I can, what can I do about it? I'm just a uh, blank. Um, and I don't want anybody to leave here thinking, well, you're just a blank, therefore you can't do anything. You know, I, I've given presentations to medical professionals. They're like, well, I'm just a doctor. What can I do about it? And I'm like, you're, you're trained to restart human hearts. <laughs> you, you, you can do a lot, you know? So I hope that uh, in getting to know one another and getting to know your interests, um, I'll do my best to address them as we're presenting. I'll give you a little bit of information from my end. And then if we leave anything, then please, by all means, this is a conversation, not a lecture. Um, so my next slide, really quickly, I just wanted to acknowledge, uh, you know, happy 125th birthday, Blackstone Library. This is my first time actually being physically in the library. Uh, and you should have seen me beforehand. I was running around trying to check out all the, <laughs> all the cool design features that were there. Um, but I thought there was this really cool tie to uh, climate history here. So the Blackstone Library opened June 17th of 1896. And just a few months prior, in April 1896, there was this publication by a Swedish professor. Uh, if anybody can speak the language, I apologize. for uh, Svante Arrhenius is how I pronounce it. Um, the publication name is on the influence of carbonic acid in the air upon the temperature of the ground. Uh, what we need to know, what's taken from that, is that that was the first paper that was published estimating the increasing surface temperature of the Earth due to the increasing amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, and that was the first time that we were introduced to this hothouse or the greenhouse theory about why the planet is warming up. So I thought that was a cool little connection. The library that we're in um, was around the same time that this paper was published. So today I'm going to concentrate on four very specific um, uh, sectors here that are being affected by how, uh, I'm sorry, being affected by climate change. We can go into detail into other ones. I just thought these might be the four most important to know, um, and they're temperature, air quality, extreme events, and infectious diseases. And before I begin, I'm going to say a caveat, but I feel like the entire conversation up to this point has been caveats. <laughs> um, but I do want to point out this um, slide and let everybody know that while climate change is affecting everyone, it doesn't affect everyone equally. So in this particular slide, you see we have communities of color, children, low-income communities, older adults. Um, there's other communities that are left out of this, like uh, outdoor workers, uh, migrant workers. There's a lot of overlap with the people who might be affected a little bit more by climate change. Um, so something to think about, uh, I'll, I'll point out specifically to, to children, um, children aren't just small adults. I feel like a lot of people think that, <laughs> but they're you know physiologically different. On hotter days, children are affected more by increases in temperature, in ozone pollution. Um, older adults are the, the same way. Communities of color who may have been subjected to you know historical redlining, so their houses are located near um, you know areas that have a little bit more toxic air pollution and lower income communities who may not have the resources to remove themselves in times. In this case, they, they listed flooding as, a, as an example. So just keep that in mind as we're talking about all of these effects that we're seeing in Connecticut, that there are certain communities that are affected more by it. Um, if you want to take out your cameras, you're, you're welcome to do so. I put this in. This is a uh, link to a report that just came out last week from the Yale Center on Climate Change and Health that's discussing energy justice in the state of Connecticut. 
So you often hear that sometimes people don't have enough money to pay for their air conditioning, so their electricity is shut off in the middle of summer during a heat wave. Or you may have people who are trying to make the decision between do I buy groceries and medicine or do I pay my electric bill this month? Um, that was a student-led project. It's absolutely wonderful. It's very well done, um, heartbreaking, but heart, um, uh, very well put together. Um, you should definitely take a read of that in case you are interested in um, energy justice. So now, finally, I'm going <laughs> to hop into the four main topic areas that I was referring to. So the first one is temperature. So we know that the temperatures around the world are going up. In Connecticut, being a part of the world, <laughs> temperatures are also going up here. Uh, this particular map that you see on your right is actually an aerial heat map of the state of Connecticut. And you'll notice that there's a lot more areas of concentrated heat pockets around big cities. If you want to know, you know, the $10 word <laughs> for it, that's called the urban heat island effect. So you're seeing communities that are built near cities feel hotter um, throughout the year. In the summer, it becomes unbearable. If anybody's ever driven past you know, New Haven or Bridgeport or a major city with your window down, you feel like that immediate heat hit you. Those communities stay warmer for longer simply because there's a lot more concrete asphalt um, and that built environment around them. Whereas areas, you know, say around, around here in the Northeast corner, there's a lot more tree coverage, so it tends to be a lot cooler up there. A little bit of background before we actually get into the little fact that I have there, that um, on average between 2007 and 2016, there were 422 emergency department visits and 45 hospitalizations for heat stress or heat-related illness uh, in Connecticut. Did you have a question? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, the city's being hotter? Effect. Yep. Um, thank you for raising that, by the way. If at any point anybody has a question, please interrupt me. <laughs> I'm happy to be interrupted. Um, so on average, here we go, 470 or so hospitalizations, uh, I'm sorry, visits and hospitalizations due to increasing heat in the state of Connecticut. But I want to point out that this actually might be an underestimate. And that's simply because if uh, somebody calls say an emergency or goes into an emergency department and is saying, you know, I'm having a cardiac issue. You might be admitted for having a cardiac issue, not a heart or cardiac issue because it was so hot in your uh, apartment that it started messing with, you know, your, your bodily function. So keep that in mind. We actually think that number is an underestimation um, and there's research coming out hopefully soon that will give us a little bit uh, uh, of a better number. The next topic that I want to talk about is, is air quality. If you're not familiar with the American Lung Association State of the Air Report, uh, essentially what it does, the American Lung Association creates report cards for every state in the United States and says, you know, how healthy is your air? Um, CT, Connecticut, regularly gets failing or very bad to failing grades. So this is the 2021 report card. And you can see we have one, two, three, four of our eight counties actually received an F for poor air quality, uh, according to the American Lung Association. Everybody else didn't really do too well. Um, we're seeing some high ozone days. Fortunately, since about the 80s or so, we've seen the number of high ozone days reduced, but we're seeing a bit of an uptick again um, in the trend lines. And I apologize, I don't have that graph on here. Um, we're also seeing, because of these warming temperatures, an increase in pollens and allergens. So if anybody is a seasonal allergy sufferer like I am, you may have noticed that you start getting snifflier. <laughs> is that a word, snifflier? Does that sound like a word, right? Uh, earlier and earlier in, in the year. So I think I had to start taking my allergy medicine this year, early March. And over the decade or so that I've lived here, I used to start taking it in about May. Um, so we're seeing that uh, earlier allergen season start in the state of Connecticut, but we're also seeing it last longer because the temperatures are so warm that things keep blooming well past when they're not supposed to be blooming. Um, I should have put this picture on, but I, I added it to our Instagram page um, or our Twitter page, one of the two. 
Um, I have a picture of this wonderful rhododendron that's blooming in mid-November of last year. You know, flowers aren't supposed to be blooming that late, especially not rhododendrons in the state of Connecticut. And then the next one, uh, point that I just want to talk about very quickly, what affects our air quality in the state of Connecticut, uh, are wildfires. Now, we do have some wildfires in the state. You may have heard that Middletown had one um, a few weeks back, but it's nothing compared to what our neighbors, everything good? Oh, okay, just making sure. Um, it's nothing compared to what our neighbors on the other side, on the west coast of the United States are facing. So. Here we have an image of the bootleg fire in Oregon. Um, what happened in Oregon was that there was so much burning of material and all that smoke has to go somewhere. So you can see how smoky it is in this picture here. Um, this is a, a smoke map from NASA showing the, um, the smoke being produced on this day, July 20th. And then you see all of this here. That was actually the smoke that traveled from the west coast of the United States over to our side of the country. So even things that are happening somewhere else in the world, on another part of the country, are affecting us. So you can see Connecticut is there, um, and we're that orangey color. So we're right about here in this map. That's very thick smoke cover that was happening in Connecticut. Um, this image happens to be from July 21st, 2021, the day right after the, this forecast map was released. And this, I believe, is out of East Hartford. That haze that you see there, that's all wildfire smoke that was attributed from the Oregon fires. Go ahead. Uh, do you think that because of climate change, the wind patterns also change, or do they stay where they are? Yeah, you, you know, um, so, over, so a bit of background before I address that question in case other people don't know. So there are already like these larger weather systems happening around the world. So that particular pattern there was already following the, uh, the jet stream that was going over the United States, which is why you see sort of that, that pattern there, that like S-shaped pattern. Um, do I think that the um, overall climactic changes are affecting some of the weather patterns? Yes, we can get into the very specific details of that um, uh, just in, uh, after maybe a slide or two because there are some other things that I want to attribute to uh, changes in weather and then we can circle back. Is that okay? Great, okay. Speaking of extreme events, um, extreme weather events, I should say. Um, in the state of Connecticut, we're seeing an increase in the number of se severe weather events uh, happening in the state. So from 2010 to 2019, there were nine federal disaster declarations in the state of Connecticut compared to 13 that had happened in the 56 years prior. So we're seeing that increase in extreme rain events, hurricanes, superstorms, things like that. So you see this image here of this man having to scale the chain link fence that was out of, out of Hartford and that happened in 2014. But I want to point out the caption that's not from a hurricane or anything. That just happened to be a very rainy night. Um, and the infrastructure wasn't ready to handle that inundation of rain. Um, so something to keep in mind for our communities, we might see some roads getting washed out. I know we see um, water may flood signs that are popping up all over the place. A, a, a gentleman at a, at a conversation last week um, uh, pointed out that sometimes those signs that said water on the road, they used to be like sandwich boards. They would put them out temporarily, but now they've had to put up these permanent signs because the roads are flooding a lot more often that they couldn't keep taking the boards out there. Um, so something to keep in mind, there, there's an increasing amount of extreme weather that's affecting our infrastructure. And then the last bit that I want to cover is infectious diseases. So warmer temperatures, just like us, mosquitoes love warm temperatures. So that means that there's going to be an increase in the number of ticks and mosquitoes um, here in our state. We're also seeing an increase of species that are expanding into Connecticut that we're not used to seeing here. They didn't like being here because it was too cold for them. But now because the weather is warmer or the climate is warmer, we're seeing an increase of these uh, tick species in Connecticut. And we're monitoring that to see if that means that we'll see an increase in uh, diseases associated with those ticks. Now, 
I put this slide up here, <laughs> maybe uh, for a reminder for myself, but also for realizing that I just dumped a lot of information on you. <laughs> so I'm gonna run to get my water bottle, but does anybody have any questions about anything that we've spoken about so far? I'm still listening, I'm just gonna. Comments, anything that people have seen in their experience uh, in their neighborhoods? Like, what have you seen happening? Did any of the previously related things speak to you? When you've done these lectures elsewhere, do you have any people who show up that are kind of like the naysayers who, you know, are deniers and kind of challenge the whole concept? Yeah, luckily, we, I don't think we've had naysayers. We've had some uh, skeptics, but not some outright, you know, protest signs. I don't believe what you're saying. <laughs> Great. So the reason why I put this pause is because we're going to transition a little bit. So now that we've talked about problems that are going on, I want to make sure that we actually discuss solutions. Because <laughs> if you left here thinking, oh no, the world's ending, I haven't done my job, and Barb, you should kick me out of the internship. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> so, here we go. Some solutions and ways forward. When I created this uh, slide deck back in about January or so, the first two points were things that we just wanted to happen. But I want to point out that the first two points actually were passed uh, in the Connecticut General Assembly this past legislative session. Um, so achieving 100% zero carbon electricity and supply by 2040, that's now Public Act 22-5, uh, which is signed into law um, last month, June. Um, same with Public Act 22-25, which uh, offered more electric vehicle rebates, increased electric vehicle charging stations and infrastructure, and also provided funding for electric buses. Um, they're improving the active transportation options. That's a very fancy way of saying <laughs> there are other alternatives to taking a car somewhere. But I want to be, I want to qualify that statement. Sometimes a solution can be we want fewer cars on the road, therefore let's have more bikes on the road. Right, you know, that, that makes sense. Bikes, bikes are great, I have a bunch of them. Um, we need to untie what happened with that statement though. So if we say we just want a lot more bikes on the road, we have to make sure that the streets are actually safe for people to use bikes. We have to make sure that there's clearly marked lanes and safety for bikes and for people who decide to use them. We have to fill in potholes. So even though we're saying, let's just improve active transportation, Increasing the number of bikes does not mean that people are going to automatically start using them. So there's a lot that can take place with improving our uh, active transport options. Um, supporting federal action to limit interstate pollution. So if you remember back to the wildfire slide, um, smoke that was being produced in one side of the country was being brought over to Connecticut. Um, smoke's not the only thing that's brought over <laughs> to, to Connecticut. So one of the main reasons why we regularly get failing grades on the American Lung Association um, uh, report card is that a lot of the pollutants that are brought over to the state are actually brought over from roughly the Pennsylvania area due to the uh, hydraulic fracturing or the fracking for natural gas that they're doing there. Uh, so finding ways to actually limit that interstate pollution, uh, there, there's a lot of proposals out there right now. I will admit that I am not an expert on those. I'm learning along with you. Um, and if anybody has questions about that, if you're really being like, I want to stop interstate pollution, more power to you. I will happily research along with you to make sure that uh, we can talk about this a little bit better. Um, improving communications to the public prior or to during ozone alert days. How many people are aware that today in the state of Connecticut, there was a uh, ozone alert released by CT Deep. Everybody shaking their heads no. I got one yes. <laughs> I got one yes out of how many are we here? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Well, well I guess I don't count as a yes. Um, 
But that proves the point. <laughs> that was released by the state of Connecticut, but people didn't really hear about it. Um, that would be super helpful for anybody who's say an allergy uh, uh, sufferer, an asthma sufferer, other people who are immunocompromised or have respiratory illnesses. We need to make sure that those people are getting that information. Um, so it was released. The way I saw it was because I was browsing Twitter. I do the social media for my workplace. I wasn't <laughs> just like scrolling through my lunchtime. Um, well, technically, I was. But uh, it, I saw it released by uh, CT Deep on Twitter. And then they put that alert. CT what? Uh, Deep. Okay. Um, and then they put that press release on their website. But it didn't go out in the news. I, I haven't heard it. No. Well, I'm um, thinking of the health department, perhaps. We should, and we are closely associated with these, but they didn't send it to me. Mm -hmm. um, they don't send their alerts to the local health departments. So perhaps we should start monitoring that mm -hmm. so that we can put that information out. Yeah. You know, a, a colleague from mine, I believe it was in Colorado, pointed out that their system there is that uh, fire, EMS, emergency medical services, and police actually have flags outside of their station. So if there's an orange alert day, they will put up an orange alert so that as people are driving by, they can see that there is an air quality alert. So that might be something that we consider doing. Um, just a suggestion. So that's the big like policy action, state level um, items that we can do. But then uh, to your point, we were talking about personal actions. What, what can we as individuals do? Um, one of the best things to do is organizing as a community or awareness raising and education. So I wanna point out, thanks for being here. <laughs> the fact that you showed up to actually learn more about this is one step in the right direction. Um, we added this and I'll, I'll get into a little bit more detail, I believe in the next slide. Um, if you own your own home, you can sign up for an energy audit that's subsidized by the state of Connecticut. Has anybody done a, an energy audit? No, okay. Um, you can technically do it for apartment buildings as well. I know sometimes they say if you're a homeowner, I'm not a homeowner, I have an apartment building. Um, it takes some negotiating with the landlord, but typically if, uh, the way that I phrase it is, you know, at the end of the day, you pay like $75 to do this energy audit. Um, and what they suggest could save the landlord hundreds of dollars throughout the year. So typically they're, they're receptive to. Um, opting into renewable energy sources. Um, in the state of Connecticut, we're seeing an increase in offshore wind. If you have the means to afford solar um, energy for your own household, you can do that. Barb, you have solar on your home, is that right? Yeah, we had it looked at. And, yeah, they looked at. Uh, they All you need for a solar panel to work is sun. So, <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, renewable. We, we talked about active transport. Um, uh, again, public transportation uh, or transit, biking, walking. But you got to make sure that the system actually is uh, amenable and makes those things happen. Um, and then finally, electrifying things like heat pumps and, and uh, if you can, getting an electric vehicle. All of this is to say, and I forgot to put it in. Um, is that, and I just want to make sure that I address your point, um, some of the things that are listed here are like buy a, an electric vehicle, make sure that your home has solar energy by buying a solar panel. Um, what else do I have there? Uh, uh, buy an electric bike, you know, if you can. But that's often not attainable for a lot of people. 
So I think what's missing here is for us to be to be able to say is that you, you've got to be able to do what you can with what you have. The climate crisis is not going to be solved by people buying, you know, $60,000 Teslas. If you can, go for it. That's awesome. <laughs> I would like one. Um, but it's not going to be solved with $60,000 Teslas, $2,000 uh, electric bikes, um, you know, solar arrays that you put on your private home that, that you own. It's going to be a lot more, I think, on the community organizing and making sure that we're looking out for the communities that need it the most. So going back to that idea at the very beginning, there are some communities that are more affected um, by the climate crisis. Um, what's stopping us from doing something like a community solar panel, you know, where everybody sort of buys into that, that large array that is in, in a public area that can then be used to subsidize people's um, um, electricity. Uh, why are electric rates in Connecticut so expensive? Anybody have an answer? If there's any representatives of the electric companies in Connecticut, please speak up. But essentially, it's it, it they it's profit. <laughs> you know, electric companies can control what they want that price to be. Uh, Barbara, make sure to knock me off of my uh, soapbox if I start getting a little too high up on it. Well, we uh, did have um, and last week we had somebody from the Brantford um, Clean Energy Commission. Mm -hmm. actually have a couple more here. Uh, Blue Earth Composting was the company that we we're referring to, but we have a question here. I want to make sure I have a, just a good understanding of what are the leading causes of the global warming. Sure. And I'm, I'm just like getting that based on this handout, mm -hmm. it's fossil fuel-based power plants that are producing energy. Those are the, that's the leading cause of global warming. Fossil fuel extraction, fossil fuel usage, anything related to fossil fuel, which eventually turns into carbon dioxide, which is what causes a lot of the global warming, or uh, uh, is attributable to, to being the main cause of it. Okay. Yeah. So how does you know, global manufacturing, how does that play into it? Because global manufacturing is demanding a great deal of energy to manufacture? Yeah. Um, do you work in the manufacturing industry no, by chance? Okay, just one. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, yes, yeah, so, um, you know, it, it's, I was gonna say it's a dirty little secret. It's not really a secret, right? So um, I had to drive to get here, <laughs> you know, and I don't have an electric vehicle. Um, to buy the shirt that I'm wearing, it was probably produced, you know, in a plant, and unfortunately it's a synthetic material, so it was probably made using petroleum-based products. And then it was shipped to the store and then I had to drive to the store and buy it. So um, that's uh, my example for manufacturing. So what, whatever we buy is going to have an impact. Um, production, driving to get it, uh, uh, having it up in a store, shipping it out, that's all going to contribute 
because at every stage of that process, you're using some sort of fossil fuel to, to make it happen, essentially. Does that make sense? I want to make sure that I, I didn't confuse <laughs> you. Did, so, so in terms of the solutions, you know, it's not that simple to say, okay, just you know, reduce manufacturing. It's changing the way things are manufactured. Exactly. Yes. Which is why voting for the right people and voting and being aware of what bills are up in front of the House and the Senate is really important so that you know, okay, are they voting to let fossil fuel companies and to let companies release as much carbon dioxide that they want, you know, or are they voting to keep uh, regulations on these industries, which may cost industries a little more money, honestly, but keep our air clean? And, and given that most manufacturing is now over in Asia and China, um, that that makes it very difficult for us to be able to take some kind of you know, political action to affect you know, regulating that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was a bill recently about computer chips, right? Yes. And, it, it, and having them made here. Yeah, the acronym was the, I think it was like the CHIPS bill or the CHIPS Act, mm -hmm. where essentially it would, it would move, or rather it would provide subsidies for the production of processors and chips uh, in the United States, so we don't rely on other countries to make those for us. So that way we can bring a lot of the manufacturing back mm -hmm. to, to uh, North America. And having great um, relationships with these other countries, that we can have these treaties that require, and everybody signs onto, that they're going to try to, try to reduce the reduce of fossil fuels, right? Those things are really, really important, and uh, we got away from those things uh, in the last decade because the political winds blew that way. Correct? Mm -hmm. So now it's our job to try to turn that tide and make those connections with people that we can have a voice that we don't want that. We don't want the, you know, we want to try to affect what's going on. We want to have cleaner air. We want to have, you know, more environmental justice where our cities are full of little kids with asthma because they're breathing in so many toxins and pollutants in the air. Yeah, thank you for that. So that, that's that's a good point. Um, and do I eventually get to? I eventually get to lots of points, but um, <laughs> you know, uh, one of the previous points here: community organizing, awareness, education, um, and involvement. I think might be the most important thing that you can do, right? So showing up to the Brantford uh, Clean Energy Committee and showing it's like, hey, listen, town of Brantford, where I'm from. We really want to start investing a lot more in these renewable energies because uh, what you said was wonderful, Barb, but I just want to make sure sometimes um, we, we make a point like that um, and I don't want anybody to ever feel like, oh no, I now have to take on like multinational corporations <laughs> to make any difference. Um, which if you want to do that, go for it. More, more power to you. I, I, all the best. But um we also want to make sure that you as an individual are making a difference in the area that you live and the spheres that you actually have control over right i, I have no say whether you know shell is going to extract more uh oil and make record pro uh, profits at like two thousand dollars a minute or something i think for the last few months um we'll get into that later because <laughs> but, but globally, act globally. thank you yes um, but we do have an opportunity in my town to, uh, you know, be a part of the uh, climate change task force that is asking questions like, well, why aren't we using, say, the solar, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, freestanding um, coverage in parking lots that are just sort of like there, why aren't we putting solar panels on that? You know, why, why don't we use that to create energy for, for the town or for town buildings? Um, yeah, go ahead. 
I want to, I just want to ask real quick, um, does the transfer station charge, uh, do you have to have a sticker to get to the transfer station with your compost? No. No? Okay. You said you live in an apartment, correct? Yeah. Okay, so I, I live in an apartment too, and don't let me get too far off on this subject because I've said it many, many times. If we want to hold a workshop on how to compost, <laughs> I will talk about that for hours. Um, I, because I live in an apartment, I don't really have my own like backyard compost bin. If you have the means, wonderful. But like I said, do what you can with what you have. I use a five gallon bucket from the Home Depot uh, with some of those wood shavings that you use for like hamster bedding uh, oh. to compost all of my food. It works wonderfully, okay. um, but we can get into that later. Okay. Um, again, here are some resources for you all. Uh, Blue Earth Composting was the company that we were discussing earlier that for about $25 a month, they'll pick up your, your food scraps. If you have the means to do that, buy them, you know, go for it. Um, if you've got to find a way around it with the $5 bucket from Home Depot, then happy to talk about that as well. Um, Cheaper, which stands for the Connecticut Hydrogen and Electric Automobile Purchase Rebate, um, is what can give you additional incentives to buy an electric vehicle or, or an alternative energy vehicle if you are in the market for one. Uh, please don't feel like you have to go out and buy an electric vehicle. The best thing that you can do for the environment is actually to just use what you have um, until it's no longer usable. Um, Energize CT is the program that we were talking about with the energy audits for homes and apartments, so take a look at that. Energy Storage Solutions is a, a program that will help uh, customers install energy storage at their home or business if they have a solar array on their home. Um, so if you're worried about, oh, you know, if there's a storm, how am I going to get power? You should be fine <laughs> nonetheless. Um, but if you want the additional assurance of having an energy storage unit, essentially just a giant battery, um, the state of Connecticut will actually subsidize that for you. Um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but that website does have all of it. Um, please feel free to join the Brantford Clean Energy Committee. Is anybody here a, a member? I feel like all the talks we've been given, somebody kind of pops up, so just asking. Uh, uh, that will be, as Barbara mentioned, the location where they can have lots of different ways that you can get involved at the local level. Um, voting and active political involvement, which I've said multiple times. Uh, political involvement, it's not just showing up every four years. I think we, we've um, kind of gotten used to saying, I've done my part, I got my sticker, everything is going to be okay. Um, I don't think that's what political involvement is. You know, Show up to different things, conversations, committees at your town, um, committees at your workplace. If there's a sustainable committee at, at somewhere that you work, you know, inquire what they're doing. Um, there's a wonderful article that was produced on Gris. Uh, the title is, What Can You Do for the Climate? Not Everything, but Start Here. And it lists 13 different things that you might consider doing to, uh, in your own personal lives to control sort of like your, your um, carbon emissions. But before we get too far on, uh, into this. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. In touch with the Brantford Clean Energy Committee. So, um, I, if you give us our email, uh, your email before you head out, okay. I will just send that to you, and all of these links are clickable. Oh, cool. So, you can Google it if you want, Brantford Clean Energy Committee, and just make sure that you're on the town of Brantford CP. Um, or I'll send this to you, you click on it, and it'll take you. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. You know what really bugs me? Go ahead. Is lawn mowers. All of that energy that is being consumed by landscaping equipment and lawnmowers mm -hmm. and such. Do you have like any like estimate of you know how much all of that stuff is contributing to um, I don't have the exact numbers but I'll I'll answer it with, with a couple of news stories that I know about. So um, in Las Vegas it's now illegal to have a grass lawn because they would use up so much water <laughs> that they just outright banned them. Um, so there's a movement in some circles, I've, I've seen them around Connecticut, that getting rid of your lawns and planting, say, like a wildflower meadow or something like that makes a whole lot more sense than watering your lawn, you know, every two days and mowing it. Um, what's interesting is that some towns actually have it written into their town rules that people can't do that. <laughs> um, that they cannot do that. 
So um, some of the political involvement that I was just talking about might be showing up to your town council and inquiring, can I plant you know, a wildflower meadow in my yard and will I get in trouble? And if they say yes, asking, well, why is that and how can I change it? Um, unfortunately, I don't have that list off the top of my head. I, I put that down somewhere about four months ago. But if you want that list, um, we can exchange emails and I can get that information to you. So in addition to it just being wasteful water-wise, you then have to buy the lawnmower. You have to pour gas into it to make it run. Or you have to get, hire somebody. Or hire somebody. Or you have to get the weed whacker. You have to put gas in it. <laughs> or if you decide to you know, electrify all of your tools, you can have an electric lawnmower and an electric weed whacker, but you still have a, a water, um, a heavy water use thing that you keep putting water into. <laughs> um, so I'm a big proponent. Uh, I can't do it here at my apartment. Um, um, they do let me plant flowers around, but I just want to relay the story. Uh, my parents are down in Texas and I kept telling them, it's like, why do you have a lawn? It's 110 degrees every summer. <laughs> You're wasting so much water <laughs> trying to make your lawn green. So I actually convinced them to turn about a third of the backyard into uh, native flowers and cacti. And they're like, we haven't done any work back there in years. And it just looks nice. <laughs> I was like, yeah, now do it for the rest. But you know, I feel like I have to make a trip down there and do it, do it all, you know, be the good son and dig up the lawn and put the, the cacti in. Um, but look into that. Yes, I, I think that lawns are very wasteful. Um, it's also a lot of, again, soapbox. Um, imagine if we were using lawn space to grow vegetables, right? That'd be cool. I don't have a garden uh, space in my, uh, in my apartment, I do have a community garden plot though, but imagine if my landlord let me plant vegetables like in front of my uh, like little grass area in my apartment. That'd be awesome. Uh, if anybody is a gardener, I think Barb and I bonded over gardening and we can talk about gardening. Uh, I actually think one of the handouts has uh, the effects of climate change on flowers, so um, you can look into that. So I'm just gonna shift very quickly to, to this worksheet that was the, another part of the participatory, um, is saying, how do we actually take action? And I alluded to at the beginning that nobody here is just a blank. I'm not just an employee at Yale. I, you saw at the beginning, I'm also an EMT. Um, I'm a grad student. I, I'm an intern with East Shore. Um, I'm a gardener, right? We have all of these different spheres that we identify with or these identities for us. So we want to make sure that if you're sitting there thinking, it's like, well, what am I going to do? I'm just an office worker. No, you're not. <laughs> Hopefully this worksheet helps you out with that because we want to make sure that you are taking the actions that you want to take. So that worksheet outlines what brings you joy, which um, most of you, I think all of you actually answered at the beginning. <laughs> what are you good at? And then what do you notice in your neighborhood that needs doing? And then once we put all of those things together, we can talk about like, so what is that specific climate action? Uh, Barb, I think you gave an example last week, am I correct, uh, about this? Uh, it, it, if not, you know, I can go no, through but I can tell you what brings me joy. Sure, absolutely, go for it. Finding into a summer tomato out of my garden. Um, what am I good at? I'm good at growing tomatoes. Um, and so what needs doing in our neighborhood is encouraging more people to grow their own food. Mm -hmm. it, it helps on so many levels. Mm -hmm. It helps, it's good exercise, it's nutritious, and you're saving, you know, in your own way, people, you know, driving trucks of tomatoes to the store. So, you know, in, our, in my own way, my own little biome, I think. My husband and I always talk about what if the whole infrastructure of the United States fell out, right? What do we do? Well, at least we can feed ourselves because we are. Right. Like, we know how to feed ourselves, we know how to can tomatoes, we know how, you know. So, in our own little sphere, you know, we're doing what we can. We're, we're actually helping the air by growing plants, you know. Um, we don't use a lot of water. Um, I live in a place that now if somebody built a house there, they wouldn't be able to because there's wetlands on three sides of it um, through parts of the year. So even in this hot, hot weather, you know. And, you know, so that's what we're saying. Like, what are the little things you can do with your life, those three? 
three things, you know, what brings you joy, what you're good at, and what do you see needs to be done. And so I like to share with other people about gardening and help them out and, uh, you know, in the ways that I can encourage them. Cool. Yeah, thank you. So um, we can work on that, but I just want to point out um, we're nearing the, end, the official end of the presentation. Uh, but as you're looking at that worksheet, you're still like, well, I don't know, you know, what needs doing. <laughs> uh, is anybody familiar with Project Drawdown? No. So there were an organization that was started, um, I was going to say a few years ago, honestly, about a decade plus at this point, um, that was trying to get people to take action in different arenas or sectors. So they divided it up into three main areas, sources, sinks, society. And then they put a couple of uh, uh, bullet points underneath those. So, um, you know, let's say if anybody in here is an architect, right? They might consider working on buildings and seeing if they can do like green construction, making sure that it's carbon neutral uh, or sequestering carbon. Um, somebody who might be involved with uh, a sustainability council in their job as say a medical assistant at a hospital might say, okay, why are we producing so much waste? Like, what can we do to curb the amount of medical waste that we're producing? Um, if you're still a little unsure, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to read all of these out, but there were 93 of those different sectors um, or topic areas that people can take action in. So uh, I was immediately drawn to this, walkable cities, which is kind of what we were talking about. We say that walking is healthy for you, it's better for the environment, but what if there are no sidewalks in your community? That's a big problem. So you could take action in walkable cities. Uh, food waste, Barbara, I think, was talking a little bit about, you know, uh, food production and food waste. Um, food uh, and composting. Um, I was gonna throw out, <laughs> I think food waste is a very dumb problem for us to have, that we're, we, produce so much food and then we waste so much energy to make it and then um, the average American family throws out about a third of the things that they buy from the grocery store every year. Mm -hmm. So I say as an example, you know, if you go into the store and you spend $100 on groceries and you put everything into three bags, on your way out just dump a bag in the garbage. You know, because that's essentially what, what most people are doing anyway. Um, so what can we do to reduce food waste? And then once, let's say unfortunately, you do your best and you still produce food waste, how do we compost it? How do we turn it into something that's usable um, in our gardens, in our lawns? Uh, somebody, I think, mentioned, uh, I overheard it earlier about turning food waste into uh, biogas that we could actually use. There is a couple of plants in Connecticut that do that. Um, if you're inter oh, there's composting. If you're interested in solar power, uh, efficient aviation, trucks, shipping, cars, um, what else do we have? seaweed farming, which is actually taking off in the state of Connecticut as well. Um, aquaculture, high-speed rail. There's lots of areas that you can take action in. So I'll come back to this slide, but I just want to say officially that's the end of the presentation. Happy to answer questions. You are more than welcome to reach out to us, the project team. Uh, um, one of the things that we're working on is gathering the stories of climate change that people are, are uh, talking to us about. So I guess maybe let, let me explain that a little bit better. Everything that I just went over right now is, is like data points, right? Averages, 400 and some odd average people uh, hospitalized due to heat illness. But I think oftentimes what's missing in those stories, those articles that are being produced is the human side of it. So the reason why we're here is because we care about our community and presumably we care about one another. Um, there's data points that are, I think, falling through the cracks. And those are sort of the, the oral histories and the things that are peop people are seeing. Um, we had, as an example, uh, a couple came up to me last week after the presentation and said, you know what, we've lived here for, uh, for 15 years in the state of Connecticut. We didn't have to buy an air conditioner until five years ago. And we didn't really have to turn it on until this year. So in their own way, they just charted the fact that temperatures have been getting hot enough for them that they needed to invest in an air conditioner. So one of the projects that we're doing is trying to track those oral histories, those, those moments of uh, climate change that aren't 
found in the traditional data. So if you're interested in that, we can talk about it more, but you can also take a picture of that. Uh, and there's the project website.